Well, welcome everybody. Uh, Daniel, a great call on the music, or Gretchen, maybe that was your call. All Daniel. Oh, okay, Daniel, great call on the music. Um, and welcome to everybody out there. It's a great turnout for our uh, Wednesdays at lunch with the GLC. Uh, I'm gonna get right to the chase. Uh, it's a great pleasure. I'm David Blight, director of the Guild of Lehrman Center. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have Gretchen Long here for the entire semester. She is our one and only right now fellow because we've not been allowed by the restrictions and protocols of COVID to have our one month fellows, but we have Gretchen here for the full semester and possibly even longer, we hope. Uh, Gretchen is a professor of history at Williams College. She holds the Frederick Rudolph class of 42 chair in American culture. She's taught at Williams since 2003, did her PhD at the University of Chicago with, do I say, uh, the great Tom Holt, uh, among others, uh, and Julie Seville. Uh, she went to Wesleyan University as an undergraduate, so not unfamiliar with Connecticut either. Um, she's the author of the book, Doctoring Freedom, the Politics of African-American Medical Care in Slavery and Emancipation. Gretchen holds many hats, wears many hats, I should say, including history of science, as well as African-American history, the history of slavery. Um, and we, I could name a lot of her articles as well, but we're in for a treat. Uh, she is going to tell us about, I love the title, my mother would go hunting at night to get a possum to feed us. Um, Gretchen, uh, for anyone who hasn't met you around campus, which is all too many people, I, I, I suspect because of COVID, uh, you can still meet Gretchen at some point this semester, I hope. And uh, maybe even next semester, we're working on that too. So uh, Gretchen, welcome officially to the GLC and uh, I'll turn it over to you, thank you. Sure, thank you, David. Um, can you all hear me? Is that volume okay? I think so. Okay, so thanks so much to uh, the people who've come today um, and uh, includes some people from afar, my family who I know, I hope are, are watching, but mainly I wanna thank my new colleagues here um, at the GLC, uh, Lisa Monroe, Tom Thurston, Dan Vieira, um, and, uh, most especially uh, Michelle, Melissa McGrath, who put together the um, image and the poster for today, David Blight for that introduction and the incomparable Michelle Zachs, who um, I appreciate her presence here at the GLC um, this, this semester very much. I also just wanna thank a student of mine at Williams College, history major, Lucy Walker, who helped me last summer start to put together some of the um, sources that I'm gonna talk about today. So today I wanna to share with you the beginnings of a new project um, I'm working on. It's a new book project. It centers around enslaved women and the work that they did uh, preparing, distributing, and getting mostly food um, for their families and communities. And this brown bag, I, I hope you all are munching your lunches. Um, while you listen, it's supposed to be a work in progress and I'll say a caveat is very much in progress. And um, I, uh, I hope to just sort of share with you some of the central questions that have been animating my work and some of the sources that I think begin to, to answer them. And one more thing before we plunge in, I will be using the WPA narratives as a key source in this talk. These are oral histories for people that don't know that sprang from interviews with elderly African-Americans that were done in the 1930s. And I'm just gonna read the words as they were transcribed, even though there's a, it can be a little problematic. And at times I'll put up a slide with the written transcriptions so you can refer to them your, yourself. Okay. So food and hunger appear as twin through lines in colonial and antebellum African-American history. For example, Maddie Gilmore, an elderly black woman raised in Texas and interviewed in the 1930s, remembered the, um, remembered the rations that her master provided. Here, I'll share my screen. 
for a moment. She recalled, we had cornbread and black eyed peas and sorghum molasses. Our old master gave us our rations. And if that didn't fill us up, we just went lank. I nearly used those words as the title of this talk. And I'll return to the rations that white slave owners supplied later. But I do wanna pause a bit and study Maddie Gilmore's words. I think they bring up a reason that I find this topic compelling. Her words, we just went lank, evoke an oft repeated physical experience of hunger in her life. Lank implies not just hunger, but physical weakness. In this passage, Gilmore first recounts a list of foodstuffs, and second, the grim reality of what happened when rations were not enough. Maddie's mention of food and not enough food in the same sentence illustrates a grim and often constant reality for many enslaved children. Black women who often had chief responsibility for children toiled in water, in forests and in fields to stave off their children going lank as many days as they could. This talk explores the hunting and fishing that black women did to protect their families from hunger. These activities, when successful, helped to fill what I call the protein gap between the carbohydrate heavy rations that slave owners supplied and the protein needs of African-Americans, particularly children. I hope to also show how even as enslaved women scrambled to confront hunger, their solutions to a daily problem yielded up cre creativity, cultural expression and tradition, but also power, bullying and hard choices. So how did enslaved women attempt to provide a balanced and adequate diet for themselves and their children? Learning how Black women managed, planned, and improvised, providing nutrition for their families, has leads me to other questions about the working of gender and patriarchy, as well as about enslaved people's relationship to their physical environment. What I see coming out of these questions is how getting and cooking food could grant enslaved women some measure of social power. Skill with food allowed Black women to gather their families together, pass on survival skills to children and fend off hunger. In distributing food, we, also, we see alliances and fellowship as well as rivalries and feuds. I'd like to start with a brief quotation from Frederick Douglass's autobiography. And you can see he's watching over my shoulder here on the wall. Um, this is from My Bondage and My Freedom. Sorry. I infer that my grandmother especially was held in high esteem, far higher than is the lot of most colored persons in the slave states. She was a good nurse and a capital hand at making nets for catching shad and herring. And these nets were in great demand, not only in Tuckahoe, but at Denton and Hillsborough neighboring villages. She was not only good at making the nets, but was also somewhat famous for her good fortune in taking the fishes referred to. I have known her to be in the water half the day." So, so there's a lot to unpack in this recollection. Douglas goes on in the same paragraph about his grandmother's talent, even genius as a, at horticulture. Douglas only lived with his grandparents as a young child, but this memory that he paints so vividly for us involves the gathering and obtaining of food both cultivated with sweet potatoes and wild fish. Fishing for hours in waist deep water was tiring, cold, and potentially dangerous work for his grandmother. Elsewhere in the writing, Douglas remembers her fishing with a sen net, which was weighted down at the bottom and then floated up at the top. I have it's kind of a basic drawing there of a sen net and then a more modern um, photograph of a man pulling a sen net um, in Africa. In thinking back on his memories of his grandmother, Douglas praised her skill in making nets and taking fish. Not only did this skill help her to feed her family, um, but her skill at fishing helped establish her reputation throughout the neighborhoods. 
Her skill at growing and catching food not only allowed her to provide steady nutrition for her children and grandchildren, it gave her a share of social power and reputation in the midst of a system that devalued her intelligence, resourcefulness, and humanity. Across the South, enslaved women like Betsy Bailey worked to increase the amount and quality of protein their children ate. For those with access to waterways, fishing provided a way to secure that, um, that protein. Women enslaved at George Washington's Mount Vernon plantation in the late 18th century would likely have been able, much like Douglas's grandmother, to fish in the Potomac River. Um, this is a map of Mount Vernon uh, plantation from 1793, and you can see along the bottom, the Potomac runs right, right there. Um, in 1798, Washington described the Potomac as, quote, well stocked with various kinds of fish in all seasons of the year, and in the spring with shad, herring, bass, carp, sturgeon, etc., in great abundance. In fact, the whole shore is one fishery, unquote. The Potomac provided 10 miles of shoreline to the Mount Vernon plantation, and here is an aerial view today. Um, of Mount Vernon, and you can see how, how accessible the river would have been to the hundreds of enslaved people who worked there. During the spring, when shad and herring swam upriver to spawn, George Washington's massive enslaved labor force worked intensely to catch these two types of fish. The Black people gutted and cleaned the fish, saving the bones for fertilizer for Washington's fields and probably for their own gardens. This salted fish provided the core of their rations from Washington year round. George Washington allowed five to eight ounces of salted fish per adult worker per day, in addition to one quart of cornmeal. Washington sold the rest of the fish, much of it to Jamaica, to serve as rations for the enslaved people there working on vast sugar plantations. It does seem ironic to ship fish to a British colony surrounded by water, as Jamaica is, but this example gives us a chance to reflect on the ways that food, labor, and slavery connected Black people throughout the Atlantic world. Enslaved people at Mount Vernon caught and cleaned the fish that enslaved people in Jamaica would eat weeks or months later after money changed hands between Washington, North American agents, Jamaican agents, and planters in the West Indies. While Washington compelled his enslaved labor force to catch, clean, and preserve shad and herring every spring, both the Washington family and enslaved people ate fresh fish throughout most of the year. The 10 miles of shore would provide enslaved women a chance to supplement their family's diets with fresh fish without needing to leave the plantation. Understanding the role of fishing in enslaved women's lives sheds light on the workings of gender and marriage in slave communities. As African-Americans across North America could attest, the structure and fragility of slave family meant family life, meant that many black men did not live on the same property as their wives and children. And about 15% of the people Washington enslaved had spouses who lived away from Mount Vernon. And Washington was known to threaten and make good on threats to sell slaves that displeased him. So men from Mount Vernon may have visited bringing fresh fish, game, or other supplies with them to wives and children on other plantations. Meanwhile, some of the women enslaved at Mount Vernon would have waited for husbands visiting to bring meat and game. Black men traveled as often as they could to and from Mount Vernon and other plantations with food, money, treats, and news. To bring fresh fish or fresh game to their families, however, would have taken, would have usually, they would have needed time to hunt or fish during the week. In um, Dylan Penningroth's work on the economy of slave communities, he argues that a black person's time was actually the most valuable commodity. That is getting land for a vegetable garden was easier than finding free time needed to tend it. Hunting for wild game and most types of pole fishing are expensive in terms of time. An enslaved man would need enough time to hunt in addition to the labor he performed for the master. For most men, that meant laboring on some kind of uh, cash crop, cotton, tobacco, sugar, or rice. 
he would need enough time, enough luck, and enough skill to bag consistent animal protein for his family. Additionally, he would need permission and a pass from his master and the health and strength to walk to the plantation where his wife and children were. These contingencies meant that enslaved men could not be totally reliable in their visits or what they would bring with them when they came. One can imagine that a woman reliant on a husband from a neighboring plantation for fresh meat would do well to become an expert fisherwoman. For women without husbands, fishing could fill in the protein gap. Georgia Johnson, interviewed at age 74, remembered her own mother and grandmother, both of them enslaved. Her mother had been born in Maryland, but an abrupt sale separated her from her father, sister, and brother. Georgia's grandmother and mother were brought south and sold together in South Carolina. In their new environment, Georgia's grandmother found herself with a child to feed without contributions from male kin. Georgia remembered her mother saying, Ma said her didn't never see no hog meat till she came to this country. Her said day ate at all sorts of fishes, just went to the beach and got crabs, oysters, and swimp with the hull still on them. Georgia's memory of her mother's history sounds as if these women lived in a coastal area perhaps by an estuary that could provide calm waters and shellfish that a child and a woman could gather and cook when their labor for a slave owner was done. Since Georgia's mother did not remember eating any pork while living with her mother in South Carolina, it could be that the slave owner expected enslaved people to provide the bulk of their own protein. Perhaps he, like George Washington, used salted fish in the rations. We don't know much more about Georgia's grandmother but like Frederick Douglass, Georgia's mother's memories of her mother were entangled with the variety of fresh fish that her own mother could procure. This ability to provide for herself and her daughter may well have allowed Georgia's female relations to remain somewhat independent, perhaps to exercise a bit more control over the men they allowed into their intimate lives. Having been sold away from husband and children, the fishing meant that the women could nurture an emotional self-reliance as well as vital physical survival skills. Many black women, however, did not have such easy access to a fishery or estuary. Most received some kind of preserved or salted meat from their enslavers, but often not enough to prevent their children from going lank, as Maddie Gilmore said, or like Frederick Douglass described the many hungry days of his own childhood. Enslaved families often depended on hunting fresh game or keeping private livestock themselves. When women's husbands were absent, infirm, or unlucky, many women took to surrounding woods and fields themselves to hunt. Hunting presented different challenges than fishing did. While women like Georgia Johnson's grandmother took young children along to help gather shellfish, hunting requires endurance and silence. Enslaved women seemed often to hunt at night or at least in the evening after daytime field work was done. Hunting at night meant children could be left asleep or in the care of an older child while a woman ventured out in search of small game. Nighttime hunting also meant expressly breaking the rules of farms and plantations. In agricultural journals, planters dwell on the importance of enslaved people being accounted for and in their cabins at night. As with other clandestine activities, Black women must have weighed their risks as they set off to hunt. While women may well have learned to shoot if a male family member had a gun, a noisy large firearm was not practical for clandestine nocturnal hunting expeditions. Archaeological excavations of enslaved people's dwellings have found animal bones, mostly squirrel, possum, rabbit, raccoon, and some wild fowl. These small and medium-sized animals could be caught in snares or traps, which could be homemade and had the advantage of silence. Southern white culture did glorify hunting for white men and connected the sport with ideas about masculinity, wilderness, and danger. White elites, often with enslaved men riding or walking alongside, hunted large game, um, mostly deer, with shotguns and dogs. The hunting that Black people recall in these oral histories, though, is very different. 
Mary Mariah, interviewed in Maryland, recalled that she was put to work in tobacco fields when she was 10. Recalling her family life, she does not mention a father. She says, we were allowed fat meat, cornmeal, black molasses, and vegetables. Mother cooked my food after stopping work for the day. I never ate possum. We would catch rabbits in gums or traps. And as we lived on the rivers, we ate any kind of fish that we caught. Like George's mother and grandmother in South Carolina, the impression is that Mary Mariah and her mother and grandmother formed a family of women who supplemented the monotonous rations of fat meat and molasses with rabbit and fish caught by women. Her mention of possum, even to note that she'd never seen it and that she'd never eaten it, implies that she knew it was a common food for black people to eat. Clearly some whites enjoyed possum too, although many elites write about possum and raccoons as unsuitable meats for white people's palates. WPA narratives mention possum more than any other game. Um, slow moving, omnivorous and nocturnal, possums were often cooked in one pot, in a one pot meal with a bit of salt pork and vegetables, and they provided calories and protein for generations of black people. And since we're all mostly used to seeing possum, at least I am as roadkill, I thought I would just uh, show us. There's one, and um, there's a mother with babies. Israel Jackson, an elderly African-American interviewed in the 30s, he gave me the, um, the words of this talk. He was interviewed in Arkansas where my own ancestors lived. His mother also seems to have been a main provider of fresh meat. Israel Jackson said, oops. My mother would go hunting at night and get a possum to feed us. And sometimes old master would catch her and take it away and give her a piece of salt meat. But sometimes she'd bury a possum until she had a chance to cook it. Catching, killing, and dressing the possum while her children slept was not the only ordeal Jackson's mother faced. His memory of old master catching his mother and trading the fresh meat for a piece of salt meat is telling. Although his mother had hunted the game, she had no right to keep it back for her children. The forced exchange of salted meat for fresh game reveals that the white old master acknowledged the value of fresh meat after the monotonous diet that he provided. Jackson's mother's skill and resourcefulness at hunting, hiding, and cooking established her in his memory as a powerful person half a century after slavery ended. For some slave women, hunting was an activity that they could do with young men their own age. Harriet Jones remembered her youth saying, we rides down and goes hunting with the boys for wild turkeys and prairie chickens, but, the, like, but we like best to hunt for coons and possums. Joseph Holmes recalled hunting with his younger sister saying, my ma had eight children and we were raised in pairs. I had a sister that come along right that come along with me. And if I climb a tree or went through a briar patch, she'd done it right behind me. Ma wanted to know why her clothes were so tore up when they was pretty. We'd make it right with Ma by having a rabbit or coon with us or sometimes a mud turtle. For Holmes's sister, hunting with her brother was a time when gender boundaries loosened. Their mother, while upset about the clothes, valued the fresh game that her son and daughter brought home. The hunting skills that Holmes's sister gained may well have served her in good stead in adulthood when she would have to provide for her own family. Holmes's memory of his younger sister and the mother and daughter pair fishing together in Georgia reminds us of the necessity of enslaved girls learning not just agricultural and domestic skills. With the threat of sale and separation, Young children needed to learn something about staving off hunger and providing for themselves by living off the land. The oral histories above, I've tried to illustrate this with the oral histories above, but as I move past the sources and the WPA narratives and into documents and images created by white actors, I am gonna to try to continue to center black experience with preparing food. With some door sources, it's difficult, but I'll show you some of the more challenging pieces of archival evidence that I found. This is um, 
an advertisement for a public auction of slaves in Charleston in 1833. And we could move through each line of this and parse, um, parse it, this public sale of Negroes. However, for our purposes, I wanna look at the first person listed for sale. And here, forgive me, I'm gonna to have to um, change the view so that you can see it properly. There. Okay. Um, so the first person for sale, she like the other people advertised here is not named on this document. We learn only that she is a valuable Negro woman. And among her virtues are that she is a good plain cook. The ad notes that this woman will be sold off with two of her children, presumably the 11 month old infant and the five year old boy. The two older girls aged 13 and seven will likely be sold apart from their siblings. Since the valuable Negro woman, whose name we don't know, is a good plain cook and dairy maid, perhaps she, like Georgia's grandmother and Joseph Holmes, has taught her young daughters something of cooking, but also how to get hold of food, how to milk a cow, and perhaps save some of the milk for one's own family. The girls mentioned in the ad may have hunting and fishing skills as well. The one-eyed 16-year-old who you see down here, the 16-year-old wench has one eye, um, and the dozen or so women accustomed to field labor and working out of doors that we see at the end there. Um, uh, they may be accustomed to working out of doors and have some familiarity with hunting techniques. We don't know who purchased them or where they ended, ended up. And compared to WPA documents, this slave auction advertisement is brutal and almost casual in its dehumanization, but it does give some clues about possible food ways and home training that daughters learn from their mothers. We can imagine that skill in hunting, fishing, and cooking might help these young daughters survive the separation from their mother. In documents, and images that white people produced that highlighted their enslaved laborers and food, they tended to stress celebration, abundance, and plenty. Images like this one stress the congruence of eating, labor, and celebration. Indeed, corn husking parties on farms and plantations did happen, and accounts from both whites and blacks describe them as occasions for work, but also for competition, music, dance, and drunkenness. From the amount of corn we see in this picture, though, we can conjecture that such part parties occurred rarely, perhaps once per, har per harvest. There's another one. Um, corn husking would necessarily follow an intense time of corn harvesting, most likely in the summer months. In the image here, you can see the woman with the large basket of corn. During the revelry, she might be able to secret some ears away to supplement her own family's rations. This next image, too. Oops. Oops. Okay. This next image shows um, Black people are depicted relaxing. The ones in the background here are sitting at a kind of picnic table, eating and drinking with no sign of recent or upcoming labor. They are, however, um, supervised somewhat indulgently, it looks like, by these white people up in this sort of tree house here are looking down. These visual depictions of abundance of food and the ambiance of a white master's generosity and free handedness with food is actually quite at odds with the exact accounting of rations that planters distributed to enslaved workers. A large planter writing for DuBose Review in 1853 stipulated that each week he supplied to male field, hand, male field hands three and a half pounds of bacon and one and a half pecks of cornmeal. Women, boys, and girls who worked in the field got a bit less, two and a half pounds of bacon and one peck of meal, and his indoor hands got still less, two pounds of bacon and one peck of meal. The careful differences of the amounts that should go to men versus women, house laborers versus field laborers, reveals how keen white slave owners were to monitor their profit margins. Paying for slaves' food was a serious and daily expense for owners 
whose expenses in the 19th century involved complicated finances involving mortgages on black people, mortgages on land and houses, projections on the price of cotton, the price of slaves, and indeed the price of money. Keeping costs for, for rations low while exacting labor meant, meant, meant was measured out in pecks of cornmeal and pounds of cotton. We've talked about the successes that black women had in hunting and fishing and the remarkable ways that their, pro their prowess um, at procuring food. I wanna keep in mind though, the words of Maddie Gilmore who laid out the facts. Our master gave us rations and if in that didn't fill us up, we just went blank. Certainly enslaved families and communities pooled resources, shared and even gave away food and protected one another from hunger as best they could. But in the system where the time women could spend fishing or hunting was so controlled and regulated by demands of white overseers and enslavers, and when the ability of enslaved men to provide supplementary food was easily curtailed by a master's whim or a sudden sale or illness, it's foolish, I think, not to consider what hunger and competition for food did to enslaved communities. Scarcity could inspire ingenuity, cooperation, and generosity, but it also had to engender conflict, jealousy, feuding, and a dreadful kind of triage about who was worthy of food and who was not. The experience of hunger was certainly a fact of life in most slaves' lives particularly those with limited access to white kitchens or whose masters were particularly stingy with rations or too hard up to provide sufficient ones. The monotonous supply of cornmeal and salted fish and salted pork, much of that preserved meat shipped from plantations like Mount Vernon or even increasingly in the 1840s and 50s from pork processing centers in the Midwest would have made sources of fresh game um, novel and, and valuable. We see some evidence of this darker side of hunger and competition in slave culture. The Burr Rabbit tales, for example, are funny and the situations that the animals end up in, being talked or tricked out of a warm house, being stuck fast to a sticky tar doll are so absurd as to charm the listener. But as any anthropologist or good listener can tell you, folk tales reveal generational, generational anxieties, phobias, and circumstances. The Barabbit folk tales address the scarcity of food and the competition between community members for food resources. The talking animals in these stories, most notably Barabbit, himself an animal that frequently ended its life in a snare and was skinned and consumed by enslaved families, this rabbit shares Black people's concern with finding food, particularly protein. The male animals in the story often, stories often complete, compete for sexual or marriage partners, but often also um, compete out of hunger and, for, and their family's hunger drives the action of the story. The animals usually need food for that day. They don't seem to plan or conjecture about feeding themselves in the long term. The talking animals in the stories routinely try to eat one another, trick one another into eating one's own parents or children. Enemies are lowered into pots, winners eat, losers go hungry or are eaten themselves. The pervasiveness uh, in these food stories of food, plenty and hunger reveal how central control over food was to enslave people. This picture is um, from the a first edition of the Joel Chandler Harris, uh, Uncle Remus Tales. This is Burr Rabbit on top. This is an oven and inside the oven is uh, Burr Wolf who's been tricked into going in there and now is being cooked alive. And you can see all of Burr Rabbit's children who are quite skinny um, waiting for him to, to be cooked and, and so they can eat him. While images and memoirs produced by white people show an abundance of food and a generosity from slave owners and fat and generous mammy slaves, it's clear that in black memory, a shortage of food was the omnipresent concern. And while many enslaved people shared their food um, and did look out for each other as best they could, I've discussed already how women gained respect and status from their abilities to hunt and fish, often without the knowledge of white overseers and owners. 
This power over, over food combined with its scarcity did set up though a system of winners and losers when it came to nutrition. Frederick Douglass depicts his grandmother as a woman with the talent and diligence to gather, grow, catch and kill food. Other black women during his childhood are also wrapped up with intense memories of food, Aunt Katie and his mother. The character of Aunt Katie grows sharper through Frederick Douglass's autobiographies. Aunt Katie was Douglass's distant relation. I think his grandmother's cousin, glad David Bright is here, correct me, um, in whose care he was left when he had to leave his grandparents' home at age seven. That transition was traumatic emotionally but also nutritionally. Describing a slave childhood, Douglas writes, his food is the coarsest kind, consisting for the most part of cornmeal mush, which often finds its way from the wooden tray to his mouth in an oyster shell. Aunt Katie had charge of about 12 enslaved children, three of whom were her own. She was a skilled cook, according to Douglas, and an ambitious woman. Douglas describes the arrangement um, that, of how she fed the children. Old master, instead of allowing so much for each slave, committed the allowance for all to the care of Aunt Katie to be divided after cooking it amongst us. The allowance consisting of coarse cornmeal was not very abundant. Indeed, it was very slender and in passing through Aunt Katie's hand was made more slender still for some of us. William, Phil, and Jerry were her children, and it is not to accuse her too severely to allege that she was often guilty of starving myself and the other children while she was literally cramming her own. Want of food was my chief trouble the first summer at my old master's. Douglas goes on to describe his relentless and constant strategies for tiny bits of food eating crumbs that were shook off tablecloths from the dining room and fighting with a small dog over scraps. Occasionally, he says that old slaves would give him a meal and words of comfort, but these meals appear to have been few and far between. Aunt Katie then had control over the rations that the old master distributed for all the black children. And she's not a sympathetic character at all, but I think it's worth pausing and considering the position that she was in while Douglas remembers that she crammed her own children, in the context of a mother feeding three growing boys with a monotonous diet, she might have only given her sons adequate meals. We don't hear about food going to waste under her watch. Looking at her own three children dependent on her for food, it's not surprising perhaps that she fed them more than Frederick, a small orphan with little social capital. He was a distant enough relation to her so as not to lay claim to the limited caloric resources that she had. One also wonders about the old slaves who occasionally gave him a meal. If they had had food to spare, I imagine they would have fed him regularly, but food was simply too precious to allow for consistent generosity. More frighteningly, Aunt Katie used outright starvation as discipline. And although she did this in anger, it still meant that she had more food to give her own children. Douglas recalls the day when Aunt Katie punished him by giving him no food after his small breakfast. By nightfall, after a long cry, young Frederick Douglas found an ear of corn and had quietly roasted it and was beginning to eat it when his mother, Harriet Bailey, appeared for one of her rare visits. Visiting Frederick meant a long nighttime hike for her. And hearing that Aunt Katie had threatened to quote, starve the life out of him, Harriet Bailey produced a ginger cake for him to eat and angrily confronted Aunt Katie, delivering a lecture that she never forgot. His mother appeared on the, this day and replaced young Douglas's dried out roasted corn with the moist and sweet ginger cake, which he describes in detail, a heart shaped with a rich dark ring on the edge of it. The lecture on food that she gave Aunt Katie and the confrontation proved her maternal love. And he writes that evening that he was just, not just a child, but somebody's child. And we have a sort of reverse direction of food because ginger and sugar that would have made that ginger cake were probably in, grown in the West Indies and then um, shipped up to, to North America, to Maryland where, where Douglas was. 
Douglas told versions of this story in um, a number of his autobiographies and the life and times of Frederick Douglass has its illustrations, the 18 illustrations. The first illustration, which is the one um, that advertised this talk, um, here we see young, Fred, young Frederick Douglass sheltered by his mother as she confronts um, Katie. It's interesting to me that Douglas and his editors and illustrator chose this scene to illustrate out of many. They could have left Aunt Katie out and just showed Harriet Bailey giving the cake to Frederick during their tender meeting. The conflict between these two women over food reveals the, the food significance and how withholding and giving it displayed power as well as affection and acrimony. The sources I've used in this talk today, WPA narratives, Planters Journals, Folklore, and Douglas's narratives, begin to give us a picture of the enormous role that food played in daily lives of enslaved people. In their daily struggle to feed their families, enslaved women relied on rations from masters as well as any food husbands or male kin might be able to catch or kill. In many cases though, black women and girls hunted and fished for themselves shaping new gender expectations and fostering self-reliance. Their skills at hunting and fishing won admiration from their communities and established different relationships with their environment than laboring on a cash crop could ever do. For Douglas's grandmother, waist deep in a cold river catching herring uh, to a mother forced to hold, hand over the possum she had caught and planned on cooking, Black women expended time and resources to supplement and increase the nutrition that their children got. Even with the extra food they brought in, hunger and the threat of hunger remained ever present. The conflict that Douglas saw between Aunt Katie and his mother and the their tensions over the food that for rabbit tails show us reveal a dark side of the daily privations of slavery. This hunger and the conflicts it engendered were difficult problems against which to mount a resistance. And I'll just finish by saying um, Black women's hunting and fishing rem remains a, a surprising phenomenon to this day. I visited the Yale Center for British Art on Sunday and found this uh, painting by, um, of uh, Lynette Yedam Owake by Kahinda Wiley um, with her stylish shotgun and polished leather boots um, and then the dead rabbits all around her. I think it stands in stark contrast to the kind of hunting the black women I've talked about today had to do. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Gretchen. That is a stunning painting, my goodness. I suddenly wanna have you analyze that painting. Uh, the, the woman in her glasses with this modern, seems like modern dress and yet, anyway, I, we don't have to go there. Um, <laughs> We're gonna, we got a lot of questions. Uh, let me start off though, by picking up on how you use Douglas, which was wonderful. I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a constant theme, food of some kind. The issue of food is a constant theme in his slave narratives, especially in his early life. Um, there's even the moment around the Aunt Katie scenes where he describes how the black children are fed essentially like hogs in troughs laid on the ground. He makes a big metaphor out of that for, well, basically the savagery of, of, of slavery. But yeah, the, the way he honors grandmother Betsy, uh, he gives these vivid images of her standing in that river uh, with her nets and, uh, and even talks about how she was famous all over the neighborhood for for uh, knowing just the right depth to plant a, a yam. <laughs> I mean, it was just, that, that, that and he only knew his grandmother for five years, six maximum, but those are the things maybe we all remember about a grandmother, but especially in his case, it was all about food because uh, she was the source. But a lot of questions. Uh, can I ask you your thoughts on using the WPA material? Great source, uh, been used for years and years and years. Now, I'm not asking whether you should use them, which is an old debate, but how did you do it? Did you just, I mean, I guess you can keyword search them now, or can you? 
uh, you can't really. Okay, so you're just going through looking for food imagery and so on, which is the only way I've ever used them. You just you just got to plow through, come up with an aggregate and find what you find. Is, is that what you did? How do you use those sources? Um, I really wish uh, my wonderful student, Lucy, could help me right now because that's a lot of what she did in the summer. But we worked together with, they are pretty well indexed. Um, yeah. Food comes into so many of them. So uh, Lucy actually made a spreadsheet um, and we came up with categories, hunting and fishing, gardening, you know, like, like that and, and tried to sort of organize them that way. I, I mean, I didn't pay a lot of attention to geography. I think that's a weakness of, of the presentation I just, I just did, um, except that some people clearly are, you know, maritime and have more um, access. But uh, yeah, I, if there's a way to keyword search, I'll feel like a total fool because <laughs> that's not I don't how- know that there is. I just know they're, they're mostly online now, although you know, they're, they're still not that easy to use, but. Uh, no, I think they're, e I find having those volumes helpful and lots of post-it notes, so. Oh, I uh, love the real volumes too. I mean, I, give me a real volume any day. Uh, my colleague in history, Regina Kunzel has just asked, uh, and welcome Regina, um, thanking you for the talk, of course. Um, she's curious about your decision to focus on enslaved women in particular, and on the significance of gender in this exploration of food procurement uh, among enslaved people. Now, that might have been a, a natural decision for you, but could you talk about that a little bit? Um, why and how working on slave women, who, you know, allegedly are not easy to find, not easy to get to, but you did. <laughs> um, yeah, I think in some ways, thanks, Regina, for that. Um, I think it's kind of hiding in plain sight. It seems so obvious yeah. because women, even as you can see from the slave ad and, and any reference to enslaved children, you know, at least for a while they're with their mother and, and women are the ones who um, look after them, who end up with them. And I think I, I maybe started thinking about this years ago when I was writing my first book and learning about rations from the Union Army and women um, advocate, you know, ask, demanding them, asking for them, saying they didn't have them. And often with children in tow who were malnourished and sometimes dying of starvation. Um, and so, it seemed like women had more responsibility for feeding not just themselves. You know, that, that, that it, it seems so basic to say that, but, um, and I think also there's a way in which we can forget how skilled enslaved women had to be. You know, that they, they didn't have these skilled occupations, yeah. being carpenters or coopers yeah. or, what have you, but the skills that they had to just keep going and raise families, I mean, like making the nets, that should count as a skilled oh. um, occupation or setting traps or all the cooking and dressing. So um, I think there's more to say about gender, Regina, and, and I'm also how in the WPA narratives as well, um, the people seem quite conscious that women hunting disrupts a gender narrative. Like the the um, the young the man who said his sister would come along with him and tear up her clothes and and such. But then it's accepted and valuable thing to do at the same time. So, yeah, I have to. I it's obvious, but I I can I can probably go further with that. What what else can you? Hold on, my phone is ringing. I'll shut it off. There we go. Um, what else can you say at this point about this question of protein deficiency or protein issues? Now, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm thinking all the way back to the famous Vogel and Engerman book in the 1970s, which was a very complicated book, but it made a case about, if I'm remembering correctly, and it may not be, but it made a case that protein by all kinds of measurements, that was that era of cleometrics, uh, 
the protein consumption among slaves may not have been any worse than it was among the white working class and so on and so forth. Whether we should make anything of that has always been a question. But what do we know about that? About, I mean, are, are there measurements out there now? Are there ways of getting at this now? Levels of protein, levels, levels of calorie consumption first, but then protein consumption among the American slave population. It would probably really be different from region to region, but what do we know about that, if anything? Well, um, Margaret Humphrey had some work on um, recruits, uh, black recruits into the Union Army. And so those were men who were measured, um, you know, pretty accurately, I think, um, you know, in the middle, beginning to middle of the Civil War, well, all throughout the Civil War. Right. Um, but certainly after the Militia Act, if I'm remembering her work correctly, and I think I am, and I should because I reviewed that book, um, they <laughs> were shorter, certainly shorter than oh. white recruits. And I'm thinking, I'm trying to think if that, if she's comparing them to white recruits in the Confederacy or in the Union Army, but they were, they were substantially shorter, which does speak to a lower amount of protein as young people mm -hmm. and, and a lower amount of dairy for mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. On those same lines, uh, we've got a very interesting question here from the audience asking you if you have any speculations, reflections on the relationship of this story to what are today often called urban food deserts in American cities, often in black communities. Uh, maybe you haven't done that research uh, and you're not a social scientist working on contemporary America, but, but are there dots to connect here in yeah. the, the diets of, of, of the American slave population and what today we know as certain kinds of nutritional deficiencies in certain populations? Yeah, I mean, I'm not a social scientist, but I will say that I think you can tell something about a society's values when you look at what kind of food they feed their children. I mean, if we, if we, and, and who, which children get what kind of food and the food deserts, that's a, that's a, that's one sort of star in the constellation, but I would also look at like school lunches, um, yeah, yeah. in prisons, um, food, you know, in, for, for people who are marginalized in various ways in various institutions. Um, and this, a lot, there is a lot of work that a lot of our country's health problems come from um, a sort of, uh, not exact, we're not eating rations like George Washington supplied, but we are eating a lot of processed food and a lot, and, um, a lot of food that is a long way from where it grew or walked around and um, and that it, or swam around. Um, and we are seeing the results um, even ironically in like obesity rates and that, and that sort of things. But I think it does tie in also to environmental um, history, something I've just sort of been starting to think about um, in soil quality, like water quality that that sort of thing. And the food, a lot of the pork, those preserved pork that slaves ate, it wasn't even from their own farm, you know, that there were these big pork processing plants starting in Missouri and such that were shipping out huge amounts of preserved meat um, to the South. There's an interesting question here. I don't, and it, it, just wondering if if this turned up in your evidence, whether it's WPA or other sources, slave narratives, for example, this person is wondering about whether you find any differences in rations or quality of food for pregnant enslaved women versus non-pregnant women. That is, did any kind of evidence emerge about how, about, in, about the care of pregnant women, which might've been self-care at times and their diets versus everybody else? Oh, that is a really good question. You know, and I, I just want to go get a book off my shelf because I may have something. But I, what I remember mainly has to do with um, like expectations for work and labor when someone was visibly pregnant. Um, not so much 
food, but that would be worth me running down. And I'm just going to write that down. <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. It's an interesting uh, possibility that, again, it, how this will turn up in the evidence is always another matter, I suppose. But, you know, I will say that the infant mortality and child mortality rates for enslaved people were much higher than white. And so I can yeah. easily, easily imagine, and that had a you know a variety of causes, but I can easily imagine that part of that was bad nutrition during pregnancy and particularly early pregnancy before they were showing, you know, um, when so much is kind of laid down, certainly folic acid and that sort of thing, um, yeah. in early pregnancy. So, and miscarriage rates are also high. You know, there's an angle of vision here. This is coming through in a couple of our questions and it certainly does in your talk. And it's, it's been thus for many years in the study of slavery. I'd just like to hear you reflect on it. That, you know, slavery gets studied for its, its brutality, its treatment, its, the sale. You know, we've got a lot of works now on the domestic slave trade and the kind of terrors of sale and so on and so forth, which of course came through in that amazing uh, slave auction notice you put up. There's just a casual division of the children and so on and so on and so on. But what is easy to forget, and that's, that's your topic, isn't it? That the everyday lives of people in any oppressed situation are still about survival. Food preparation, food procurement, food preparation which is all part of somehow nurturing children and nurturing family. And some of these women were probably cooking for large numbers of people, preparing for large numbers of people. Mm -hmm. What can you say about that? This is an angle of vision onto slavery, which is not necessarily the normative one, but extremely important. This is how people lived. Yeah, I, I think um, you or whoever asked that question is, really got to the, the spark of, of what's really drawing me to this project, which is that feeling exactly. And even my first book was about illness and, mm -hmm. and, and healing. And those are, you know, we all get sick sometimes, but um, hopefully that's not a daily occurrence. One reason I like this project and I'm interested in, in I want to keep going with this, is this is a problem that people faced every day, <laughs> every single day, you know, um, and it is very important, um, but also I think kind of these, these moments of crisis really draw us in. Someone is sold, someone dies, someone, you know, but, you know, Thoreau says you spend your life as you spend your days and we all spend our days figuring, thinking, you know, sort of like with our executive function, what's happening, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, what am I making for dinner? God, I don't know. <laughs> it's such a human constant. And I think um, with the rations as monotonous as they were, that I think that like yeah. corn and fish and fish and corn day after day, yeah, yeah. trying to um, find ways to and not just accept, make that palatable or enjoy. Right. Food. It's such a human thing to enjoy a meal together. And I think that's why, um, that's one reason I think Douglas's description of the kids just kind of eating with their yeah. hands or with shells, yeah. you know, is uh, yeah. with yeah. no fellowship or table manners or all he these never saw, He never used a spoon or fork till he went to Baltimore, at least. That's what he said. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think Michelle has a question. So Michelle, jump right in. Yeah, thank you, David. And thank you so much, Gretchen. And I can't wait to talk more in person about all of this and share some sources and ideas. But I, I just wanted to pick up on what you guys are talking about now and what you were just saying, Gretchen, about this being part of your interest is that it's an everyday thing. Um, and it's so, um, it's so visceral and it's so part of life then it's so part of life now and there's so much emotion attached to it I know you and I have talked about that a little bit 
before. But one thing you said during your talk was that um, these activities, hunting, fishing, foraging, um, generated different kinds of relationships to the environment. And that's something I've written about and am working on myself, um, but I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about that and whether those relationships, you know, carry through, do you think, to present day? Oh, I'm so bad at present day questions. <laughs> but I do okay, think, just stick to the past. I do think that the so you just want to be a historian, huh? Yeah, I do think, I mean, I'm, if you compare, say, Betsy Bailey, waist deep in the water for, you know, four hours fishing, yeah. that had to be hard and cold and just all, all, all kinds of things. Two... Frederick Douglass, you know, working on Covey's farm with the weed and he doesn't know what he's doing, you know, and part of the feeling you get, not just from Douglass, but, you know, a lot of narratives from Solomon Northrup of people who, when they're working on these cash crops, they're just, they see the affective experience seems so different than when they're maybe do, doing something for their own family. They're still outside, they're still slaves, they're still cold, they're still wet, but um, doing something for themselves and for their family where the master is not um, supervising or maybe even knowing about it. Um, I do think it just had to have a different feeling, not even necessarily a good feeling. I really don't want to romanticize the fishing and the hunting because it's, it's driven by, you know, deprivation and, and, and malnutrition. But I think one's sort of relationship with the earth, with the woods, with the water, with the fields just had to be so different um, than just trying to get enough cotton in that sack, you know, by the time the horn blows. Yeah. Well, I, I quite agree. And again, I'm looking forward to really talking with you about this, but I'll just say in terms of like carrying that through to the present, what I have found in my work, which is on um, the mullet fisheries of Southwest Florida. And mullet is a schooling fish that's caught inshore with nets, including the kinds of nets that you're talking about, which is sains. It's pronounced sains. Oh, thank you. Um, but um you know, I think that that kind of work generates a relationship to the environment that's based on sort of a, a providential feeling, you know, that this is, this is something that is vital, that sustains us. It generates a very close attachment to place and to just kind of place-based subsistence, maybe some marketing, but, you know, not a highly capitalized kind of relationship, which I think is, is what right. you're talking about as well. And um, so that's something I think that is traceable into the present, certainly in my work. Um, and Yeah, and I, I think about yeah. Betsy Bailey and how she knew how to plant those potatoes, like her own body, whether it was putting it a hand all the way a hand down or half a finger down, her own body is connected to the ground, is connected to these little seedling, is connected to her progeny that will eat this. So, you know, the, there is, um, again, I don't want to romanticize it, but I think right. the sort of corporeal experience of doing that kind of work is, you know, and I hate gardening, but it is different than, um, it, is, it is different than, than this kind of cash crop labor. Yeah. So I think all of this is relevant to questions of conservation in the contemporary world mm. and, and belonging and displacement that, that's kind of wrapped up in, in conservation issues. But we can talk about that more in person. You no, know, and uh, kind of drawing off Michelle's question, I mean, we're kind of running up on time, but, but the sense of place is hugely important. And boy, you showed that, that photograph, that aerial photograph of Mount Vernon on Oh my good Lord. But also anyone who's ever been in the Chesapeake region, uh, which I know Michelle has and I have, you know, you can't even stand in, in the Eastern shore anywhere without realizing this is a place that's about fishing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't know this, David, but Gretchen and I are plotting a little trip to the Chesapeake yeah. together. So. Uh, fantastic. Uh, good, good. 
good. I hope I can go. Anyway, maybe you don't want me to go. But I was just going to say, you know, back to Douglas, since you used him so much. Douglas actually grew up really good at working with his hands. It came out in, in Baltimore when he works in the docks and, you know, mm -hmm. all that. But all slaves, you know, were around the daily phenomenon of making life out of the soil, out of whatever was in front of him. It might have been working with horses. It might have been gardening or something. He was very good with his hands. And if he hadn't been such a genius, you know, he might have just continue to make a living with his hands in New Bedford and so on and so forth, who knows. But, and, and when, he, when, he, when he is remembering his grandmother, I mean, what does the kid remember about his grandmother from five years, six years? He's remembering that he's so proud of how famous she was mm -hmm. at planting yams and fishing for those chad, shad. Uh, you know, that's what he can remember. And he remembers a little ladder in her house and that sort of stuff, details. But it, it, it's what his grandmother was important for, you know, and, and he could take that from it. And so, which leads me to this, this last little point or question. I mean, we all know that food is related to memory. You know, the smell of food, the nature of food, the, you know, what your, what your mother cooked or whoever cooked. Isn't that part of what you're finding here that in the sources, slave narratives, which are all remembrance, mm -hmm. WPA narratives, which are remembrance of old folks, but it's it's remembrance sources, remembrance literature, and food is just a huge part of cultural memory. It always has been, probably always will be, uh, and here it's out of this world of suffering. But nevertheless, it's like food memory. Folk, folk, food ways is in, in part a food memory, isn't it? I mean, yeah, I think. I think there's sort of two strands to that, David. Like, indeed, there's a sort of emotional comfort food, whatever you, Pop-Tarts, whatever it is that you remember, or meatloaf, or who knows what. And, and uh, when people remember their families and their meat childhood. Meatloaf with bacon on top. Yeah. <laughs> but I think in, in, when we talk about slavery, this, it has this shadow of hunger. Yeah. That, that walks right with it. And so, and, and practicality, like I didn't, I cut this out, but I had a section on Harriet Jacobs and her, oh. you know, her grandmother was a, she was a baker for money. Um, she, she sold food and that is a way that she kept that household going. Um, you know, the grandchildren, the hidden Harriet, everything. She made crackers and jelly and this kind of thing. And that was a sort of way into the market for her um, as it was, I think for, for many women in the Caribbean, that's the next thing I need to, to figure out um, for many black women. So yes, emotional and it is, it, it's very close to the heart food, but it's also, I think, has these different kind of pragmatic faces that go beyond just what one eats, but what food can do for a family's um, economic sort of life. Yeah, and uh, we have a, a questioner reminding us that this is also true in Holocaust narratives, the, the, the starvation, yeah. the hunger becomes, becomes, you know, a, a, the texture of that memory at times and so on and so forth. And, and I just remembered again, one of my favorite little moments in Douglas's narratives is where he describes how an ash cake is made. He makes a big deal out of that. He learned how an ash cake was made, which was the basic daily food, making an ash cake. You know, it's just fine is what it is, but he, he, he describes the ash cake in my new detail. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's memory, you know, it's anyway, hey, this has been fantastic. And, and I'm glad I had a lunch to eat while you were, you could almost smell that fish frying when you were talking in the early part of your talk, you know, you can almost smell it. Um, and I, I do want to say to everybody out there, it's not an obligation for our speakers to have Douglas on the wall behind him. <laughs> it just happens to be there in Gretchen's office. So it's not a, it's not a new requirement at the GLC. I just want to point that out. Uh, thanks to everybody out there. We're coming right up on 115. 
Thanks, Thanks to everybody out there who attended, uh, all 50 of you. It's great. And Gretchen, especially thanks to you. We're going to keep you around as long as we can. Uh, welcome again, and thanks for this uh, rich and fascinating talk. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I really appreciate it.